Check. Yeah. yeah, it's working. Well, Good welcome. Hour. Welcome to our session today. My name is Jack McCann, and uh, with my colleagues here, Vivek and Rajiv and Swami, we're going to go and uh, pre present an architectural overview of the new DVR feature in Juno Neutron. Um, we've got quite a bit of material to cover today, so I'm not going to go through the details of the agenda, and I'm just going to jump right into it. So just to set the stage here, uh, legacy routing in Neutron. Uh, what we have here is uh, the wrong slide. What we have here is a configuration up here in the top of a couple of VMs, a green network, a blue network, and a router connecting them uh, out to the red external network. And that's the virtual configuration. In a physical uh, deployment, that might look like something that's on the bottom here, a couple of compute nodes hosting the VMs, and a network node hosting the router function. What we have in this model, and can I ask a question? How many folks uh, run Neutron in this model? OK, looks kind of familiar. Good. Um, what we have in this model is that network node is doing a lot of work on behalf of the VMs. It provides the IP forwarding both for uh, inner subnet traffic, east-west traffic between the VMs, shown by the blue line here. It also provides uh, floating IP traffic north-south for VMs with floating IPs out to the external network. And you can see the red line from VM2 going out to the external network. It provides a default SNAP function for VMs that don't have floating IPs. And you can see that for VM1, the brown line going out to the external network. Typically, uh, access to Nova Metadata service tags along. Um, so that network node's doing a lot of work. And uh, the issues there are performance and scalability. It can also be a single point of failure. You lose that node, and you've lost all the um, communication for the VMs behind that router. Enter distributed routing. Same virtual model. A couple of changes on the physical side. The first thing you'll notice is there's now an instance of that router down on each of the compute nodes. So you've got a router down here uh, where VM1 resides, and you've got another instance of the same router down here on the second compute node. And that router will follow uh, the VMs behind it to the, to the relevant compute nodes. It will not go across all the compute nodes. It'll only go where it'll have to to follow the VMs. Um, what you get with this model, oh, I'm sorry, the other change is you'll notice the external network stretches across the compute nodes. So you have direct external network access into each compute node. What that gives us is each compute node is going to provide forwarding for both the inner subnet traffic, which you can see the blue line goes directly between the compute nodes now instead of through that network node. Also for floating IP traffic, uh, you can see the red line going out from VM2 directly out to the external network, not through that network node. Um, the metadata agent tags along, so you've got metadata service out on all the compute nodes. Um, this has nice uh, scaling and performance properties, and it also has a really nice property in that it limits the uh, failure domain. If you lose this router here, it only affects the VMs on that compute node. If you lose the whole compute node, you've lost the VMs anyway. The rest of the VMs keep working. Uh, one limitation of the current implementation is default SNAT is still centralized, so that still goes through a uh, network node. So, uh, High-level requirements and goals for DVR. Uh, w one of the first ones was to help close the uh, feature gap with uh, Nova, achieve, help achieve Nova parity. Nova solved this problem three years ago in Diablo. Um, anybody out here running Nova Network? Nova Network multi-host? OK, not so many. Hmm. Um, for those that did, this model should look familiar. Uh, we wanted this to be a provider feature. Uh, tenants shouldn't have to know or care whether their routers are distributed or centralized. Uh, we wanted to be able to configure it on a per-router basis with a global config knob that says what the default for, that, uh, for the routers are. Um, an important one, we wanted to be able to deploy this into existing environments. So you want to be able to take this DVR code, put it into an existing environment, and still have those existing routers function. And then you might want to turn on some distributed router functions. So you want to have centralized and distributed routers be able to coexist in the same cloud. Eventually, if you're confident enough, you might actually want to take some of the old centralized routers and migrate them to be distributed. Um, because that external network stretches across all the compute nodes, we wanted to minimize the user's public IP address space. 
And uh, we also wanted to leverage the existing code base. We didn't want to go and create new uh, agents, things of that nature. So with that as a basis, I'm going to turn this over to Rajiv to uh, get into some of the more details. Rajiv. Thank you, Jack. So the requirement Jack went over to address those requirements, we have made architectural changes at the layer 2 as well as layer 3 level. Through a combination of control plane and data plane changes, we have disaggregated the centralized routing plane such that most of the routing decisions can be made locally in the compute node where the VMs reside. All of these changes have been done within the OpenStack Neutron architectural framework that is of plugins interacting with the agents through RPCs and users utilizing those functionality using the API and the CLI interfaces. There's very minimal changes in the API and CLI because most of it has been accommodated within the existing interfaces. So let me illustrate some of the high-level changes. Architectural through this uh, diagram, this is a typical uh, neutron deployment diagram. So we got one compute node, uh, one controller node here, a set of network node, a set of uh, compute nodes hosting the VMs. So the first change is we have brought the L3 agent has been now, is now deployed in each of the compute node. This brings the control plane, the L3 control plane, into the compute nodes. Next, uh, the router namespace as well as the subnet gateway ports have been replicated into each of the compute node where the network gate services reside. So for instance, in this example, you would see there are two VMs uh, on the red subnet. So the router that services the red subnet would have its namespace as well as gateway ports created on this compute node. So these are replicated on the nodes that have the uh, red net subnet present. Then in order to allow floating IP access directly from the compute node itself to the external network, a floating IP namespace, one per compute node, is instantiated. This floating IP namespace has a port on the external network called the agent gateway port. Through this combination of the agent gateway port as well as the floating IP namespace, all the floating IPs on that external network are serviced uh, directly from the compute node, irrespective of which router they are. So the overhead is down to just one extra IP address, but it provides direct connectivity. Enhancements have been made to the layer two OVS agent. So as I mentioned, the gateway subnet ports are replicated in each compute node, but this replication is visible only to the VMs and not visible to the underlays and the uh, intermediate switches. So this is achieved through enhancements in the OVS agent, and Vivek would be subsequently going over that. As Jack mentioned, the SNAT functionality continues to be provided in a centralized fashion. So on the service node or the network node, you would still see a SNAT namespace. This SNAT namespace utilizes the gateway, uh, external gateway port that's allocated to the router, which has been the case for the legacy router also. So the same port is uh, used for routing all the default SNAT traffic. And to maintain compatibility, all these changes have been done in such a way that you can still have the legacy router, centralized router function, as well as the distributed virtual router coexist uh, at the same time within a deployment. The L3 agent and the uh, L2 has been enhanced to handle that kind of functionality. Now, let me switch gears and talk about how to configure a DVR. So we have added just a few parameters. So the first one is the uh, parameter called router distributed. This is in the plugin. This parameter determines what kind of routers are created when tenants create routers. So if this parameter is set to true, then all routers created by the tenants would be of distributed type. If this is set to false or absent, then the routers would be legacy or the centralized fashion. Next, I talked about L3 agent being uh, appearing in compute nodes as well as uh, in network nodes. So a mode has been defined for the uh, L3 agent. So this can be for, for uh, in the network node, it is the L3 agent is expected to service uh, DVRs, legacy, as well as the SNAT service. So the agent mode needs to be set to DVR SNAT. For compute node, it should be set to DVR. And if you just want to support legacy or continue to the old model, then it should be set to legacy or just have this parameter altogether absent for backward compatibility. Similarly, to enable L2-level distributed routing functionality, there's a flag added called enable distributed routing. You, set it, you have to set it true for supporting DVRs. 
Currently, DVR functionality supported requires VXLAN. So VXLAN, tunneling, and L2POP have to be uh, enabled, and that's listed out here for uh, your use. Now, a lot of us do our development in the dev stack. So there is a macro available to ease the configuration. It's called the QDVR mode, which goes in the local.con file. So to illustrate how that can be used, so set it to DVR mode equals to legacy. That gets the legacy uh, set up. We set it up to uh, for a multi-node uh, dev stack setup. In the network node, set it to DVR SNAT. In the compute nodes, set it to DVR. And with that, we get a deployment where the namespaces appear at the correct places, and the L3 agents are spawned in the uh, compute node. Further, we will see that as we add the floating IPs, you would see dynamically the floating IP namespaces will appear, and they would be hooked up to the uh, external bridge for uh, routing the external traffic. And again, uh, you could still create legacy routers. And this is admin level uh, CLI available to override the default settings and uh, get uh, legacy routers created. That's about the configuration. Now I'm going to dive a little deeper and uh, go over the north-south routing, how that is accomplished. As Jack mentioned, there are two flavors of north-south routing, and most of you are aware, uh, very well aware of the floating IPs and the default SNAT. So let's start with the floating IPs. So here I'm going to take an example of a VM, the red one, sending out uh, traffic to the external network using a floating IP. So the traffic arrives into the router namespace from the VM. At this point in our router namespace, we have a set of IP rules. These IP rules categorize the traffic, whether it is default SNAT or floating IP. Depending on the categorization, there are uh, different routing entries available. The, in this case, since this is floating IP, there is a routing entry that applies as forwards this traffic down to the floating IP namespace. Before the traffic leaves the router namespace, there's IP NAT rules configured for the floating IP, so the traffic gets NATed. Ends up in the floating IP namespace. As mentioned earlier, there's one for the whole compute node. Uh, the floating IP namespace has an external uh, port on the external network, and the traffic goes out through that path. In order to support the incoming traffic that is coming from external network into the VM on the floating IP, the floating IP name space has a, a host route that forwards this traffic back to the QR uh, uh, namespace so that it can be delivered to the right VM. Plus, it also has proxy ARPs enabled that allows uh, external proxies to be uh, external ARPs to be addressed. Now let's switch to the next form of uh, uh, north-south. That's the default SNAT traffic. So in this case, we have a SNAT namespace created on the network node. This SNAT namespace has ports on the internal networks, as well as has the gateway external port for, to get onto the external network. In this case, similar illustration, VM1 is sending out traffic. Uh, the traffic arrives at the router. There's IP rules. This time, the IP rules determine this is a default SNAT traffic. So the traffic is forwarded across to the SNAT namespace. And this traffic just goes as if it were east-west traffic that Vivek is going to talk about more after this. Once the traffic reaches the SNAT namespace, the NATing and the connection tracking takes place, and the traffic is sent out the external port onto the external network. Now I'll hand it off to Vivek for east-west. Thanks, Rajiv. So uh, uh, we are going to look through how uh, you know, um, east-west routing is going to happen in DVR. Typically, for east-west routing to uh, work, uh, there are like uh, three, uh, three, three, three set of uh, elements inside uh, the, uh, uh, the current neutron architecture have to interoperate in order to push a packet uh, in, a, in a routed, you know, push a routed packet out of the compute node. The first one is the router namespace itself, uh, which uh, is represented as QR, which is a distributed router namespace that's hooked onto the integration bridge, and that that's responsible for actually taking in, uh, you know, uh, packets and then being able to route them out like a normal router does in a network node. 
the the second one is the LMAC, which represents the local MAC. For every uh, for every compute node that runs Neutron, we actually designate a designate a unique MAC, which is uh, called as a DVR local MAC. And it is this DVR local MAC which would actually be carried in all the frames, all the egress frames that are uh, pushed out of the compute node as part of distributed routing. And then like uh, the third uh, element is a set of OVS rules in OVS bridges. That is in the uh, integration bridge and the uh, uh, tunnel bridge. Uh, these OVS rules uh, uh, importantly ensure that in, uh, you know, they identify which is a distributed, distributively routed packet, and if they recognize it's a distributedly, uh, distributively routed packet, they will uh, replace the source MAC of the uh, uh, incoming frame from the, uh, you know, the source MAC of the incoming frame from the BR end. It will be replaced with the, the unique uh, DVR local MAC that is assigned to this compute server. So that's what they do. And also the other thing they do is, uh, uh, while, the, 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 while the egress packets uh, you know, get, get their source max translated to unique LMAX here, the same complementary uh, action happens in the destination compute nodes where a received unique local LMAC is translated to a local DVR uh, router interface MAC. So let's, uh, let's go a, a bit deeper into this uh, east-west. As you could see here, like uh, this is basically a simple uh, diagram that shows uh, two VMs, one one belonging to red network and one belonging to green network, and these two VMs have to uh, talk to each other. So we need a router to route traffic between them. So typically, with a distributed router in place, what happens is like this VM would send the frame initially to the uh, to uh, to its own gateway. And when it does so, it will use its gateway MAC, and it will send the IP packet to the gateway. This integration bridge will, will, will know this QR router resides here, so it will forward that uh, uh, frame to the QR interface. This QR interface is, again, a distributed router, so it will take this frame, and then it will uh, rip it off, and then see the packet, and then it will figure out uh, you know, what is the MAC of VM2, and then it will replace the MAC of VM2 in destination. And here, it will put the green interfaces MAC and push it again back to the integration bridge. And now the traffic from here flows back to the tunnel bridge. And the tunnel bridge now recognizes that this is a distributor, distributively routed packet. And so it will take the responsibility to swap this QR green MAC into its own uh, local DVR local MAC here. And then what it will do is, as, uh, you know, this uh, catters, say, say if you are configured for VXLAN, this will actually add the uh, global VNI, which is probably the green, VN, green VNI here because it's a it's a, it's a packet on the green network. It'll put the green VNI, it'll put its own local MAC, and then it'll forward it into the data network. And then like on the receiving end, uh, what happens is this tunnel bridge receives it. It, it doesn't do much. It, it knows that for this green VNI, what is its local VLAN. So it'll substitute this green VNI with uh, its uh, local VLAN. And then it'll forward it with the, uh, with the other uh, compute nodes local MAC all the way to the integration bridge. The integration bridge now here recognizes that this is a distributively routed packet. And then what it does is it rips off this local MAC and puts the equivalent green uh, router interface MAC. The router interface MACs and the router interface IPs are the same in all the QRs. For any given distributed router, they are all the same wherever the routers are replicated. And so like the packets are only source routed. In the destination, the packets directly reach the VM because the translation of LMAC to uh, you know, the QR green MAC is done by the integration bridge, and the bridge puts it to the direct destination VM. So this is how a distributed uh, routing is actually accomplished here. The one more important thing here is the fact that while the tunnel bridge actually like uh, does the translation of uh, uh, you know the source interface router source, router source MAC to LMAC, at the same time tunnel bridge also has L2 population turned on. So it'll 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 be educated by the OpenStack Neutron server on which exact destination node it has to put through this uh, put through this frame. So it'll know which VTAP to forward this frame, and so it'll put it to the right VTAP so that the 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 frame as a whole goes right from the source to the destination node with no intermediate spinning in between. So this is how the uh, typical uh, east-west uh, you know packet flow works in uh, with the DVR enabled in Neutron. We'll 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 go a bit deeper into uh, you know what what 
what typically happens in the bridges themselves. As, as we saw on the last uh, uh, you know, slide figure, we had an integration bridge and tunnel bridge which cooperate, to each, cooperate with each other to figure out you know, how a packet is distributively, distributively routed and how to send it out and also how to consume it in. So here, if you see, like what we, what we did is we introduced three new tables. Uh, one, one, one table like is the DVR process table, which we introduced in the tunnel bridge. And then uh, there are two other tables that we introduced for uh, allowing ingress, one to DVR to LMAC table in the integration bridge, and then one more DVR learning blocker table in the tunnel bridge. So going back to the egress logic, uh, this uh, this one talks about uh, how a packet is uh, you know sent out from a compute node. Uh, you know it's uh, basically how a packet is routed and a distributed uh, distributively routed frame is sent out. So here, if you see like the the packet is com coming from the VM here. Yeah, it comes from the VM here. And then what happens is like here, uh, uh, it figures out this this rule won't hit because it's a packet that will have a source MAC as VM's MAC, which is red VM's MAC. And then this will go through the normal OVS rule action, and this will forward it to the locally hosted uh, distributed router. And the distributed router will uh, uh, will understand that the packet is is, is for uh, itself because it will carry the local router interface MAC. And so the router will uh, route the traffic. There is a QR here that will route the traffic and send back the router traffic back to the same table, which is maintained by your integration bridge. Again, this won't get hit because the source MAC now would actually be the QR's uh, interface MAC. So again, a normal would come. So now what will potentially happen is like this uh, this normal action would put forward a packet right into uh, the, uh, the, uh, the tunnel bridge table 0. And then so what will happen here is this will figure out that this is from integration bridge. And so it will pass to a special table, which is a DVR process table. So typically here, what happens is like this goes from table zero to table, uh, you know, table two directly. But here, like we we inter we we interrupt the traffic, and then what happens is like this. This is now sent to the DVR process table. Now this DVR process table figures out whether this packet's source frame MAC is your uh, router interface MAC, which is your replicated router MAC. If it is so, it figures out that this is a distributively routed packet, and so it will go ahead and actually translate the source MAC to the DVR LMAC that's assigned to this particular particular compute server. And then what it does, it forwards it to table two. From that point on, the action is similar. It takes the uh, green frame, and then actually like it forwards it to table 20. The table 20, what it does is it uses the pre-populated L2 rules. And based on that, based on the destination MAC in the frame, it will actually figure out which VTAP to forward that uh, forward the frame out, and it is just that uh, you know that it is just that particular uh, mm, uh, you know like VTAP that will be chosen to forward the frame out. So the translation from uh, the uh, uh, the VLAN actually to VNI happens in actually this table, and the and uh, the ability to figure out whether a packet has been distributively routed is done by this new table which is interspersed between table zero and earlier table two. So this is how an egress packet flows away all the way to the destination node. And then let's go at ingress. This frame comes out here, and then it reaches the uh, uh, destination compute node. And then like uh, here again, like uh, the packet hits the VTAP port. And so it comes into the tunnel bridge. And then if it's a VXLAN VTAP port, it forwards it to table 4. And then here, the tunnel ID is taken. Say the green uh, tunnel ID, green VNI, is used in the uh, frame. That will be translated to local uh, green VLAN that's used in that compute node, which is, say, green to VLAN. And then like it will forward to table 9. So this, this table is, again, important because we are using a standard local MAC in the underlay. We don't want to learn that local MAC because that local MAC would be potentially be used to route traffic across multiple tenant VMs. So what we do is we, we ensure that the MACs uh, coming in the incoming frame are not learned. So we drop MAC learning here, and then we basically bypass the MAC, uh, the bypass the MAC learning that's typically available today in the tunnel bridge. And then this one forwards it directly to the integration bridge, the, the frame. So here, the only uh, advantage is that the, the frame will now actually contain still the local MAC, but it will have translated the green VNI to green VLAN already. And now this guy receives the uh, frame. And then he figures out it's a DVR routed frame because of the fact that the source MAC now carries the DVR LMAC of some, somebody else node. So uh, And then so he forwards it to another new table, which will take care of translating that DVR unique MAC into its own, uh, its, its own replicated router interface MAC. So, so, the, so the, crux, the crux here is that every other node will be aware of other nodes DVR local MACs. 
and it will also be aware of its own local MAC. So that, that, that logic operates here. So this guy will know that this is a DVR routed packet from some other node. And based on that, the stripping of MAC and then reinserting the local uh, proper local router interface MAC happens. And after this is done, since this uh, since integration bridge knows where the VM port is uh, attached to, attached to, and so it will directly forward the traffic to the destination VM. So this is how ingress from the cloud operates. Uh, thanks a lot. Please, Swami is. Thank you, Vivek. Check. Thank you, Vivek. So I think uh, Vivek has not bored you out. I think he went into the details of the OBS rules. So it's better to know the details. So let's get into the scheduling. So I think uh, Rajiv and Vivek covered both the east-west and the north-south. So the other part of the thing that for the DVR is the scheduler part. Uh, so when the routers are created on the compute nodes as well as on the service node, these routers are created on demand. They are not created as soon as a, a tenant creates a router. These routers are not just created for the sake of uh, routers being created in the database. They are only created if there is a need for those routers to be there. Because only there is a VM on that particular network that is being routed, then the QRs and the SNAT namespace is being created on these nodes. So the scheduler plays a major part in here uh, in conjunction with the L2 agent as well as the L3 agent, because for every VM port that's getting created on a compute node or or if you're using a single node installation, if it is being created on a service node, as soon as a VM pops up and if VM is residing on the particular network which is being routed, and if that router happens to be a DVR router, then what happens is a message is being passed from the L2 agent, the ML2 plugin, to the L3 in order to uh, create the QR namespace, and from L3 plugin, the message goes back to the L3 agent to say, go deploy these QR routers. So uh, let me show you uh, a display. So a scheduling event, so certain things trigger a scheduling event. So if you look at here, a create a router does not uh, by itself create a, a scheduler event, but you're just creating it in a DB. The only time a uh, router is being deployed in a legacy scenario is when you are trying to uh, add an interface to a router, then uh, a QR is created. But in this case, uh, so you add one or more subnets to the VM. So you add one or more subnets with VMs. So you already created a VM on a subnet, but you are not routed it. But now you are trying to route it. So you are adding those two subnets to the router. Then, as I said, uh, the events are triggered. So a VM pops up. So there is a DHCP uh, namespace being created on the service node. And then, as I said, this whole interaction between the ML2, L3, and the L3 plugin happens. And then the QRs are being created on the compute node, as well as the QR is being created on the service node. And if you have a default SNAT configured, then you have a SNAT namespace being uh, created. So we will wait until if you have configured the default SNAT. Once you have configured the default SNAT, then we will go ahead and create the SNAT and the QR on the service node. Otherwise, if you're not running Nova on the service node, then we are not going to create the uh, uh, for for a, because you are not going to deploy VMs in the service node, so we are not going to create the QR. It's only for the SNAT. So the next one is for FIP. What happens when, when a FIP is being uh, scheduled? So you have a, a scenario where you have the DVR implemented. So you have a compute node and you have a service node. So this basically represents uh, a north-south communication just by uh, SNAT communication, but you don't have a, a FIP namespace yet created. Now you wanted to create a FIP namespace for uh, VM3 in here, so you configure a FIP. So once you configure a FIP, then a FIP namespace gets created on the compute node, and you get a, assigned an external IP address in here on the external network, because it consume, our FIP actually consumes one external IP address on the compute node. And then internally, it's using a, a local uh, IP address that's it's used for translation. And then once it is achieved, then all the traffic of the VM, now actually VM3 flows directly into the external network. So you don't need to go through the service node anymore. So this is how the scheduling is achieved in DVR. So the next thing is like, OK, you are scheduled the router. So what happens to the namespaces that you have created and how those are cleaned up? So basically, uh, we have an option for users to turn on the namespace cleanup 
Uh, it is left to the users or tenants to configure it. Uh, we have an option, I think we showed it in the configuration part, where you can actually enable in the L3 agent whether to clean up the namespaces or not. So once you have enabled those options, so there are uh, three different actions that actually will trigger the namespace cleanup. In a FIP namespace cleanup, so we don't clean up the FIP namespace until there is no, uh, we wait till the last VM that's actually using the FIP namespace. If the last VM that's using the FIP namespace is being uh, removed, that's the time that we go and remove the FIP namespace because it's a single FIP namespace that is in there. So we, we still use it for the VMs that are currently using the FIP namespace. And with respect to the router namespace cleanup, so when, the, when there is no uh, VMs in, the, in a compute node that are currently uh, using the routed networks, then we actually go ahead and clean up the router namespaces. So this is how the scheduler and the agents, in combination with the agents, takes care of cleaning up your namespace. So you're not populating your namespaces too much on your nodes. So this has to be enabled. As I said, this is a user configurable option that we have actually provided it as an open option. So you can, if you want, you can actually go ahead and configure it. I think the best option is to go configure it so that it cleans it up properly. Again, as an, for the SNAT namespace, it's the same thing. So when you actually go and remove your uh, default SNAT service from your router, so your namespace will get cleaned up. And while your namespace is getting cleaned up for SNAT, uh, so keep in mind the QR namespace on the service node is also being utilized by your DHCP and other uh, services uh, that are using the DVR ports. So that QR namespace may not be cleaned because there are certain ports that are currently using it. I will actually go through, uh, uh, when I go through the load balancers, some of the services that are currently using the ports, which are part of the DVR network, we don't want to re remove the QR uh, namespace in there because we are removing the SNAT. So being said now about the scheduling, now we let's go back to the services. OK. there are. Uh, Currently, there are VPN, load balancer, firewall as a service, and metadata as a service. So what are the services that we do support with DVR, and what we don't have support, and what we have plans in our roadmap? So let's list out the services here. So the LBAS, we do have a support for DVR in LBAS. And then for firewall as a service, we do have a support for North-South. Uh, thanks for the firewall as a service team. Uh, they worked with our, our DVR team in order to implement this one. Um, so East-West, we had an, uh, an issue with uh, implementing the East-West because uh, we were not actually doing the routing decisions on both the nodes of the compute node. We were only doing on one direction. So we have to revisit that implementing East-West uh, during the Kylo lifecycle. And a metadata service, if you enable metadata service, we do support the DVR with metadata service. And then VPN currently is still supported as a centralized uh, service. That's why we have our design uh, designed in such a way that SNAT is still uh, in the service node and it's still centralized. And uh, we do have a current patch for the VPN as a service for distributed, but still an in progress, work in progress. So we, by Kylo, we should be having that implemented. So um, the service deployment, as I, want, I wanted to go into the detail, because there was a question in the previous session about how the firewall as a service is being uh, implemented and how it's being used in DVR. So if you look at it uh, today, as I said, the LBAS, if there is a VIP port that's being created using when there is an LBAS agent that's running, uh, it's, so we, as I said, the QR, we, we make sure that the ports that are used by uh, DVR-related uh, entities, we don't clean them up. The clean, clean the QRs until those ports are not being used. So if they are being used, then we leave it there. And so we can actually route the packets with the LBAS. So no issues there. And then with, uh, we have fixed a couple of patches for the LBAS, so no issues there. For the firewall, as we mentioned, so this is the legacy firewall in a legacy QR. The firewall is implemented in this namespace. But in the case of north-south, uh, we have firewall we have to implement in in the service node as well as in the compute node. So when you look at the service node, the difference between the service node and compute node, in the service node, we only implement the firewall on the SNAT namespace. It is not required on the QR namespace because we only support the north-south. And in the case of compute node, the firewall as a service is implemented in the QR namespace. So uh, the firewall as a service will take care of the configuration of the L3 agent. And based on the L3 agent's mode, it will try to implement the firewall rules on either the QR or the SNAT namespace, whichever is applicable. And as I said, for the VPN, um, we do have a patch. And the implementation that we have for the VPN is VPN will also uh, reside 
on the SNAT namespace. So the next one is uh, API changes and extensions. So uh, as Rajiv mentioned already, we do have a, a minor changes in the APIs and the DB. So the change that we have in the API is for administrators to actually have uh, a control on both the legacy and the distributed routers. So you can actually, there is a create command and an update command we have. So you can use these commands to override whatever the global flag that you have set, and then you can actually create both distributed and legacy routers. So uh, the table, the DB that we have modified is basically the router extra attribute. So we have created a router extra attribute. So if you enable router extra attributes for DVR, it will be automatically enabled. So we keep it separate. We are not disturbing the router table. And then we have a DVR host max, which is being used by the L2 agent. And then the CSNAT L3 agent bindings is to show the bindings of the SNAT uh, namespace. And then again, we have the ML2 DVR port bindings used by the ML2 agent. So these are the changes that we made into the Neutron in order to support DVR. And then the future plans, as I mentioned earlier, so we do have plans to support VPN. So we have a patch out there for review. And then full migration support for DVR routers. Uh, we have a HA for service node. So we are planning to work with the HA team to support the DVR migration. Uh, this is applicable only for the SNAT namespace, because uh, since we only have the service node and the SNAT namespace that is residing in the service node to have a HA uh, option, so we are going to do the HA for the SNAT namespace. And then again, IPv6 support, VLAN support, L3 agent refactor, distributed DHCP, performance tuning, and then probably distributed SNAT in the future. I hope you guys enjoyed the session. Any questions? Thank you. Do you have any questions? There's a microphone. Yeah. Sure. Mic. Sure, come to the mic, please. Uh, I wanted to ask you if uh, it's uh, possible to have a node with uh, working in both uh, DVR, DVR SNAT and DVR, just for example, if it was a uh, an all in one node just for testing, is it possible to have uh, the uh, SNAT? I think maybe Sorry, you yeah. can come here, yeah. Pardon? Yeah, sure. I, uh, give me a minute, yeah, I have it in my bag.